How are you, brother? Chris, I'm doing good, mate. How are you? <laughs> yes, it's nice to be called mate by an American. <laughs> yeah, I'm do, by Ameri way. do Americans get that? I mean, I know for you who spent a lot of time in England that you get it. And I, 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 but do they get that it's an Australian, like English thing to say mate? Or is it, is it, is it lost on people? I think we've seen enough uh, enough movies, Guy Ritchie movies, to know we can we, you know you guys call each other mate, but yeah, because it's buddy in America, right? It's brother. Actually, brother's the big one now. You know, brother. brother. I like brother. You know, it's what we all should be, isn't it? Yeah, we are but brothers, right? We we we. we I, I'm always saying this, Robert, in my podcast. Do you like Robert or Rob, or does it not matter? It doesn't matter now. Yeah. I'm always saying, Rob, I, I've just had the most wonderful time with Americans. I, I, I'm, I'm proud to have served with them, to spend time in Siganella in Sicily with the USMC. Um, I learned to fly in America. I learned to skydive in America. And a bit like everywhere, you get, you know, you, you, you get your bad apple, or you get your wayward apples. But for the most part, it's just such a wonderfully kind and hospitable country that you that you've got right um, yes <laughs> I'm not going to talk about leadership now it's, it's not a good time it's not a good time to talk about that but anyway I'm so chuffed to talk to you Robert because your um resume just reads like a I mean boy's own manual <laughs> or something I don't normally do this, but I just wanted to, for, for our friends at home. So Rob is a former USMC, so American Marine, but he served with the British Marines as a sergeant, which is, uh, I'm fascinated to hear about that. Nuclear, biological and chemical warfare um, specialist or, in, or instructor which I guess you need to be a, spe a specialist to be an instructor. Um, like myself, you've done a lot of traveling, which I, which I, you know, I can just talk about that all day. I think hey, we right. both, we both share a picture by the wailing wall in, in uh, I'm going to say the Middle East to, to keep it, <laughs> to not upset the Christians, <laughs> the Muslims, the Palestinians or, or whoever else. Um, um yes uh drill instructor my god it just goes on and also you've been a member of the SWAT team yes yeah yeah I was with uh a after I retired in 2004 I got on a police department uh here in Arizona and um spent about six years on the SWAT team so wow so let's take oh do you like the hat by the way yeah I love it yeah yeah this is one of our brothers, Ken, who's who's massive supporter of me. Um, by brother, I mean USMC. He re, he he's been kind enough to proofread some of my books for me or pre pre read them, and um, he sent me this hat. Nice. So yeah, to be honest, all I know is that the USMC is huge. There's like lot. There's hundreds of thousands of you guys, right? Right. Yeah, and we're we're the small force here in America. We're the you know we're the we're the little guys. Yeah. But still, compared to the numbers that we have here, it dwarfs us. Right, right. Yeah. You know, a bit like your aircraft carriers do. Um, <laughs> my aircraft carrier pulled a lot, pulled into Norfolk, Virginia once, and we were docked <laughs> next to the USS Enterprise or something. And it it was about eight times longer than our ship. And our ship was the biggest in, in the <laughs> when I when I was over there, actually, one of your you had just come out with a new carrier, late '90s, and I can't remember which carrier it was. But I, I uh, told the training team one day, I said that uh, we, the U.S., was looking to purchase some of your carriers, and they were like, "Really, mate? Wow, that's." I said, "Yeah, we need some lifeboats for our carriers." <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm feeling bad now because I don't know what that carrier would have been. But when I when I was in, I was on Invincible, and it was the sister ship of the Ark Royal. So, Ark Royal, I believe, was the flagship of the Royal Navy. 
we were ours was all, an almost identical vessel, except that we had we had this machine gun called Goalkeeper, and it was just insane when it worked, and most of the time it, it you couldn't get it to work. When it went off. And someone can put in the comments for me, someone can um, do a search on this, but it fired hundreds of rounds a second. Right. And the whole ship, and this is a big ship, just went. <laughs> you, wherever you were on the ship, you felt the deck vibrating under your feet. And the idea of goalkeeper was to shoot down incoming missiles, obviously, and, and, and aircraft. But... Uh, Yes, yeah, so Ken, thank you very much, Ken, for sending me this hat. Um, again, I just feel guilty that I don't know much about the, <laughs> the USMC setup over there, other than the fact you're huge. So 1st Marine Division, um, it's got Guada Canal on their, yeah. on their emblem. So I guess they've got battle honours in the Second World War. Correct, yeah. Yeah. Enough of me talking, Robert. Let, let's go back to the beginning. What did, did did you have like a hunting and fishing background that we we see on our TV here quite a lot? Actually, no, I didn't. No, I, I grew up in a small town upstate New York, and uh, just just kind of kicked around. I really didn't have any any um, outdoor skills to speak of. I was a Boy Scout for a while, and that was about it. And then I just always had this this desire to join the, the military. And um, I actually wanted to go in the army initially and that didn't work out. And then I, I wanted to be a Navy SEAL, um, but I couldn't swim very well at all. I mean, I, I could, you know, I could thrash around a little bit, but I certainly didn't think I could pass, pass buds and become a SEAL. So I, I just didn't, uh, didn't even consider it. I, I knew it was something that was just not going to happen for me. So in my senior year, so I'd have been 17, I went down just after Beirut, which uh, the bombing in Beirut, the barracks were bombed. And I went down and, and joined up and we have something where you can, you can be in for up to a year before you actually go. So I joined when I was 17, um, unlike you, which, you know, is strange over there having recruits who were 16 years old, um, which, you know, just seems so young, these were kids. Uh, but so we could join at 17 with parents' permission. And then at 18, I went in. Can I um, correct Can I correct you there, Robert? You can yeah, actually, go ahead. You can actually start the process, or when I was, when I served, you could start it when you were 15. Wow. You know, they might not take you at Limpsd until you were 16, but my, my friend went on the PRC when we were still at school. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It we uh, we criticise other countries for having child soldiers. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's funny, right? When then we do it ourselves. Yeah, so I so I went in and um, and was an infantry guy. You know, we call him a grunt. Uh, 0311, which is just a basic rifleman, and I was uh, did that for a couple of years. And I, I, you know, the Marine Corps we have we have reconnaissance, uh, which is kind of our our seals, if you will. And so I just saw that as as uh, kind of like. I wanted to be a SEAL, so that was my way to become an amphibious war dog. And um, so I just kind of, I learned how to swim. I taught myself to swim, and then I had guys who knew how to swim help me out until my swimming was sufficient that eventually I got into a reconnaissance unit and went to, went to dive school and um, got my swim. And then eventually I became a dive, or actually became a swim instructor in the Marine Corps. We call it Marine Combat Instructor Water Survival, which was a uh, nightmare inducing school, just swimming for hours on end with full kit on, um, thousands of meters, it's crazy. Robert, how is it then? Because the swimming test in the Marines, for, for people that don't know, you have to jump off the high diving board, basically, let's just say in your fighting order, um, I can't remember if we wore boot, boot boots or not but basically you sink to the bottom of the pool you've got to scramble to get to the surface it's really hard to get back up and breathe yeah. then you've got to swim down the pool got to swim back up then without touching the side you've got to tread water with one hand and hand your kit to the guy on the side then take the fighting order off and hand it to him then you've got to back away 
-hmm. and tread water for another five or, or, or 10 minutes, right? Most of the guys passed it first time. Muggins here <laughs> took all 30 weeks of training to pass, right? I just don't have any body fat. And so for me to stay afloat, Robert, it's it's all energy, it's all energy coming out, right? Yeah. Fast forward to when I'm 50, I did a quadruple Ironman for my 50th birthday. So I swam 10 miles. What I will say is the wetsuit really gives you a massive yeah, edge. Right. I mean, there's no getting away from it. A, 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 a triathlon wetsuit basically keeps you afloat. All you've got to do is put put this this bit in. But could you give any of our um, guys out there that were like me, that are weak at swimming, any, any you know, any any tips there? What What is it that turns you from someone that struggles into someone that, can swim or, or are people like me always going to struggle? No, I, th I th well, I think there are people that it, it's, you know, your body fat is so low or you have a, a fat to uh, muscle ratio, but really, so what we teach is uh, that an acronym safe, which is uh, slow, easy movements, apply your natural buoyancy. You know, your body has parts that'll float more than parts of your, your legs aren't going to ever float. They're going to sink. Um, and then full lung inflation, which I think is a big one. That was the big one for me. Cause I was the same way I would kind of sink. And so you learn to just keep your lungs fully inflated and your breaths are kind of short and sharp, you know, in and out, get air back in. And those, your lungs are your, it's, it's like uh, having water wings in your chest. And then, uh, and then the other one's extreme relaxation. So that's kind of the acronym safe. But I think the big one is for me was the buoyancy, keeping those lungs full, getting short breaths, get it out and getting to get your lungs full again. And, uh, and just becoming comfortable in the water. You know, uh, like you said, putting on full kit and, and jumping in the water is, it just doesn't feel right. You know, you start to sink, even if you're a good swimmer, um, that weight just pulls you down. And so it's just that comfort and just getting after it, just get, you know, I just had to get in the pool uh, as much as I could and just swim and just improve on my skills. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key. Yeah. It's a lovely feeling to get good at swimming, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It feels good when you, when you actually can do it and you're, it feels, uh, you know, it feels comfortable. Yeah. Again, for our young youngsters listening, I, I basically could swim a length. I could swim two if I had to, but, but after one length of the local pool, I'd just be holding onto the side <laughs> <sighs> like that. And within two years, I could swim 10, 10 miles. That's just to, just to reiterate what Robert's saying here, you know, stick at things, learn from the, the people that know how to do it and, uh, and have fun is the main thing, isn't it? Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. So what's this, a swimmer scout then? What does that, is that a, a, a Marines position or is that something? Yeah. Else? So our scouts were, so we have, uh, you know, obviously being an amphibious unit, we have, um, we have different companies throughout the Marine Corps that are, we call them raid companies and they do small boat raids uh, come in on Zodiacs. And so in Coronado, California, which, which is where the SEALs train actually. Um, and then on the East coast, we have another, another schoolhouse that teaches these units how to do an amphibious raid and how to come in over the horizon. You launch the boats from over the horizon, navigate in, in the Zodiac at night, uh, middle of the night, cold, wet, miserable um and then as we get you get to a certain distance off the beachhead you'll you'll put swimmers into the water and they kind of slide over the side nice and quiet and stealthy like and they'll start swimming in toward the beach um while the boats go back out further back out to kind of wait out there safely scout swimmers come in crawl up on the beach uh sugar cookie which is where you're rolling the sand cover in sand and then they'll do a reconnaissance of the beachhead, make sure that uh, there's no enemy, make sure they can safely bring the boats in, look for any obstacles in the water that are gonna give the boats problems so the boats aren't gonna get hung up or, um, or hit into anything. And then, and then the scout swimmers will kind of set up the beachhead, figure out where center beach is, left and right flank of the beach, 
and use some infrared chem lights signal out to the boats and then everybody else comes in. Wow. Yeah, it's good stuff. It, it, oh, it never ceases to amaze me the bravery of someone that will just swim in open water. It, the thought of it, I'll be honest, you know, I've done it because I've done triathlon. So you, you, you got to get out and see and swim a mile. Right. But, you're kind of doing it with loads of other people. So you, you don't feel so scared. Yeah. But I see guys at the beach in the summer. And we, 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 we very kindly, friend of ours, hello, Karen, if you ever get to see this, she's given my family um, two holidays in her penthouse suite up on the North Devon coastline. Uh, I should say it, as a thank you for my charity work, she, she, I don't just get given given stuff. Um, and I look out of the, the, the window of her penthouse and I see people just swimming way out. We're talking, they're half a mile out yeah. and they'll swim all the way across the bay, you know, two, two and a half miles. And then some of them turn around and, and, and swim back again. Um, and I, there's a part of me, Robert, that's going... What's the tide doing? Is the tide going to take you that way? Is it, you know, is there a rip current? Is there, is there this? <laughs> is there that? And how do you get over that fear? Uh, I, I find the best way is just not to think about it. You know, you just focus on the mission, right? You just, uh, you just put it out of your head. But every once in a while, a, a guy would get hit by a fish, you know, or uh, you'd feel something. Everybody start getting the heebie-jeebies because you know that you think about, wow, this is a big ocean and we're not the only things in it or we've had dolphins um while we're swimming in in southern california you'll have dolphins in the surf zone and they'll be right there with you and uh and that it actually always feels good when there's dolphins because you know they're kind of keeping the, the sharks and other things away but yeah yeah was, you, did you ever I have think, a run yeah. with a shark no I'll, I'll, the only time i ever um and I didn't see it, but, you know, we, when, when I would, we would do dive operations, we would always have two pieces of metal and that would be like a signal to come back to the boat. And uh, we were in Hawaii diving once a military operation and we were down and all of a sudden I heard the, the metal clanging, didn't know why, but it meant, it just means come back to the boat. It doesn't necessarily mean shark, but it turned out that there was a shark in the water. So they recalled us back to the boat just to, just to make sure nothing happened. No one spotted it except for the guys on the boat in the water. We didn't see it. But uh, that was it. I dived in Belize in the blue hole over there. Be beautiful dive sort, very, very deep. You obviously only go down 40 meters as a sports diver. Um, and the dive, the dive guide turned around and went. Like that. <laughs> and I looked over my shoulder and tw about 12 sharks were just swimming straight at me. They literally just swam straight past and the shark at the back was a, was a bull shark, um, which I'm sure, as you know, is responsible for the most most attacks on people. Right, yeah. I wasn't at all panicked. You, you feel very calm underwater. I mean, you just sense nothing's going to happen. Right. It wasn't wasn't like my heart was going or anything. I was I had a diver's knife, but um, <laughs> obviously didn't need to <laughs> didn't even need to think about using it. But yeah. So how? What, what was your sort of career progression through the USMC? Did you see any action with them or was this kind of peacetime? No, yeah. I was, so I was in for Desert Shield, Desert Storm, which I believe you were as well, right? N no, Desert Storm was the first. Yeah, that was uh, 91. Iraq War, wasn't it? Yeah. Funnily enough, I was on, on the first ship to set sail for the Gulf War for, okay. that, for that conflict. That, that was my aircraft carrier, Invincible. And just as we were leaving the dock, came over the tannoy, the captain. Um, words to the effect of, right, ship's company, we're not going. They're going to send the Atlantic conveyor instead, right? I don't know what the relevance was because the Atlantic conveyor is a... Is a um, it's an RFA, so it's a su support ship, not a not a warship. Um, all around the ship, Robert, you could hear the sailors going, "Yay!" Right, 
because they all just want to stay <laughs> home with their families and you know leave, leave the wars to the other ships. Right. In our in our mess deck, there were twelve marines like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> just gutted, staring yeah. at the floor, and um, that you know that that was it. You're young, aren't you? You've done that training. You you don't want to be left behind, but. So no, so no, I wasn't. How how oh. was it for you over there? Yeah, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. We were we were a foot mobile company. We were, I think, the only ones who walked. Um, in it was <laughs> miserable, uh, carrying everything, all the all our kid on our back, and uh, and hoofing it all the way in. But it wasn't a bad experience. I mean, um, you know, we got shelled out a few times, but it was over so quick. We sat in the desert in Kuwait. Um, and, and just, no, at that time we sat in Saudi, you know, we were waiting to go into Kuwait. So we were in Saudi for months and months. Uh, I got so good at volleyball. I think we were, we were volleyball pros by the time, by the time it kicked off. Um, and then finally we got the word it's getting ready to go and, and, uh, cross the berm into Kuwait and made our way up. Eventually we got truck mobile and we were able to truck up to Kuwait international, um, just a few skirmishes along the way, and and it was over 100 hours later. That's all it was. And then we we flew home pretty soon after that. We'd already been deployed for uh, – I had just come off a deployment to Okinawa. And so we were gone six months. We were home. I was, I was in Hawaii at the time, and we were back in Hawaii for less than two weeks. Uh, while, actually, while we were flying back from Okinawa is when, when Saddam attacked Kuwait. And so less than two weeks later, I was flying back over the Middle East um, to Saudi Arabia. Let, let's just take this a step at a time. Just checking my map here. So Okinawa, what, what were you doing there? So we do, we do routine deployments. There's units consistently that go over to Okinawa. Um, most Marine units deploy for six months at a time. So you kind of do a workup cycle where you, you, in training phase, everybody gets their training. Um, you're getting the unit up to 100% combat capable. And then you would go to Okinawa um, and you're there for six months. And while you're there, you'll do little mini deployments. So you usually get some great ports. You'll either float and go over to uh, other areas in the Far East. Sometimes you'll actually leave Okinawa and float to the Middle East. Um, and you just, you're, you're kind of like uh, that forward deployed unit ready to respond if anything happens, completely combat capable. You've got all your equipment, all your people, and you're ready to go. And then you'll do that for six months. And then you come back to either uh, Camp Pendleton, you know, Hawaii, which I was, or Camp Lejeune on the East Coast. And we just do a rotation of units over there. This is the tough thing, you know, I, I speak to a lot of young people and I'm not, without going into one, I'm not a big fan of the way the military have been used in the last 20 years. But when you hear somebody like you, Robert, speaking like this, and I think back to, you know, my time in, it, it's, it's just a different lifestyle, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. to even work in Hawaii for crying out loud. <laughs> Yeah, it, this is, it really is kind of like the stuff dreams are made of, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Well, dreams and nightmares, right? I mean. Well, it's, it's double-sided. I mean, you can be on Hawaii or Okinawa or, um, you know, I was going to say, we, you know, we, we sailed to Barbados, which is just unreal, right? But you still got to be on the ship to get to Barbados. Yeah. But you can still be in such places and be having a nightmare. I mean, it's work, isn't it? You, you know, right, if, right. If you're down the hole by hole. I mean, you're, you're protecting some secret weapons and you are literally down a hole with your, with your arm, <laughs> with your, you know, your, your rifle or pistol as we carried. Um, and you're doing that for four days on four days off. It, it's, but, um, just the places you mentioned, it, was this kind of your first experience of traveling? Yeah, yeah. As a, as a kid, I really, I went to Canada. I think Canada was the only country I'd ever been to living in New York. You know, it's, it's our neighbor. So we just go up and 
if you get into Canada. But yeah, I hadn't done much traveling at all prior to uh, to join the Marines. And then from then, it just, you know, you just get to go so many places. I mean, so lucky, just travel all over. I think I went to about 20, 25 countries while I was in. Uh, Far yeah. East, Middle East, you know, in the U.S., um, travel all over the u.s different schools and different training it's just it's just a blast right and you know we, we would always get some time to uh we call it libo or liberty you know when you're off and and they would always try to give us some time to go ashore or to uh, go and in, go into the local town and and experience the culture and, and things like that although usually when you're in herds of uh you know packs of 20 guys at a time i don't know how much culture you get to actually get to actually see. So I would always try to get off in small groups, you know, me and a, a friend or two and um, just really explore the culture. I always liked seeing the, the locals and uh, experiencing the local culture, food, what they like to do. Well, I was going to say for you guys, it must be great because you get to drink proper beer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, mobs of 20 and 30 guys wandering from bar to bar. <laughs> it's, right. But, I, I mean, it's just brilliant in itself, isn't it? It's just yeah. a great, great experience in, in itself. Um, yeah. In Okinawa. So that's got a lot of historical military significance, hasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's still, um, there's still remnants of battles there, you know, like bunkers. Uh, and, and yeah, it's very historical. I mean, yeah, there's a lot there to see. And was am I right in thinking that the um, Allies, if you can call them the Allies, used it as an air base in the Second World War? After yeah, after you know they had uh, had landed there and taken it over. Yeah, yeah. Right. So they had to they had to fight the Japanese there first. Right. Then they used that as a, a launching pad to to. For dominate the, the Pacific region, I suppose. Right, yep, yep. Yeah. And the USMC, um, have they got, like, battle honours on Okinawa? Or, or Have what? Have they got, like, battle honours? You know, did they fight? They fought some fierce battles yes. in, in that part of the world, didn't yeah. they? Oh, yes, yep. Which is the one where they're raising the flag? That's, that's uh, Iwo Jima. Iruji, of course, I'm sorry. Yeah, Mount Suribachi. It's not that I don't know. It's just I can't. With, I'm getting old, Robert, and I can't just. Oh, yeah, pull, I hear you. I can't <laughs> pull stuff out of my brain anymore. Right. It makes it sound like I don't know anything. But, but um, yeah, yeah, actually, we, one of, on one of my deployments, Tokenawa, we, we went back to Iwo Jima and we did a training exercise there. And um, I mean, we just so it's, it's a uh, volcanic island. And so the sand is very fine black sand and uh, Mount Suribachi, which is where they raised the flag, is just a massive hill. We did it as a training exercise and we actually, we actually did an amphibious assault um, similar to, to what they did. And we had, to, we had to get up that hill up Mount Suribachi and it was just unbelievable. The fact that these guys are doing this under enemy fire um, you know, just attacking that hill and getting up to the top and just, it's just unbelievable. I mean, the, the fortitude they had, you know, being there and just, and just seeing it. And we, and we got to explore afterwards. We, I think we did a two day operation and then we had, we had like better part of a day to explore the Island. And it just, we found bunkers. We found old, old uh, rifles, um, American and Japanese rifles where all the wood was gone, but it was just the metal mm -hmm. left behind. Uh, we found bunkers that still had bones in them, still had uh, human bones, remains that were in there. And just the tunnel system there they had was just miles and miles of tunnels that they would use, you know, so the Marines would would close on a, on a bunker and they would just disappear into a tunnel and, and be gone. So when they got up to the bunker, sometimes it would be empty. You know, they had just fought to get this ground and, and, then they arrive, you know, they get to the bunker finally and, and it's gone. Yeah, the, the Japanese had gone under the tunnels, escaped to somewhere else. So it was just, you know, the battle there was just intense. I mean, we, we can't really understand, can we? Those of us that haven't fought with that intensity. I mean, you could be 
an 18 year old Marine with a flamethrower and you got to burn those guys, you know, they're kids as well. And you got to right, burn, yeah. burn, burn them out of that hole. And then you got to carry that memory for the rest of your life. It's, we don't really put enough focus on that. And, and I, th I think your experience in America now, what we are here in Britain, is a, is a large suicide rate amongst our veterans. Yeah. Um, a lot of, you know, issues around trauma. Um, and uh, yeah, it's these things that, that probably need to be discussed more, more than the, the, the battles themselves, really. Yeah, I, I mean, it's the same here, mate. I mean, we have, uh, it, it's an epidemic, really. You know, guys come back. And I don't think, um, you know, you go in, you're this young kid, You've grown up on a, a steady diet of war films, which funnily enough are actually, most of them are anti-war films, but we, we kind of take them as like a, a, you know, a rallying cry, you know, movies like Platoon and Full Metal Jacket, which were actually intended to show the horrors of war and, and to be an anti-war movie. But, uh, you know, we watch them, we would watch them on ship. We'd watch, you know, watch them constantly. And it didn't see, I don't think most kids see it as an anti-war movie. I think they see it as, as a war movie, you know, as a, a glorification movie. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'd it, say, it, um, I, yeah, I don't wish to offend anyone in here, but I definitely see a trend of many people. And it's not just young people, but it's a lot of people they just really don't get what the military and war is. Um, they kind of idolize the, the forces and they don't really know what role they use for or what job they actually do. In the, I'm talking in the grand scheme of the, the, the world here and, and how brutal, utterly brutal battle is. Um, yeah. Sorry, I've just gone off on one. No, end. no, I get it. I get it. And, and it, uh, you know, and you, that sticks with you. I think mentally you, you can't unsee those things. And I think we, we have not done a good job at, uh, at giving guys some kind of an outlet um, to talk to people or to, to deal with those emotions that you feel from that. And it, we've honestly, we've created a mess in a ways, mm -hmm. you know, we, we have guys coming back and, the, and they just haven't dealt with it. And, and it's those, those things you pick up, I think you are just going to carry those yeah. along with you. And it's just, it, it's just a heavy burden. And, uh, and yeah, guys are just not dealing well. Yeah. The other thing that we're realizing, especially through doing the podcast is, um, is the the type of person that wants to join something like the marines is somebody like myself who carries a lot of trauma from childhood you know this was <clears throat> the marines for me was like my get out of jail free card it was like wow what you're gonna pay me to do that right yeah i'm i'm gonna get into training and you know Robert, I, there wasn't a single second, sorry, my microphone's in the picture and it, being a perfectionist, it annoys me. <laughs> there wasn't a single second in my 30, I think we did 32 weeks training at Linston. Not a single second I'll ever think about quitting or going home, never. To me, it was my way out of, of homelessness and, and lack of education and no no options to me in in or this is what it felt like obviously there were options but my my job prior to joining up or one of them was i was an electrician's apprentice worked for this idiot got paid 30 quid a week had to crawl under all that loft insulation stuff to you know you're stretching and all this insulations going down the back of your neck and you're trying to wire up a plug socket or something and and you've got this guy telling you you're not doing it good enough you know so 
wasn't a difficult one when I got into the Marines to, you know, it was a good option for me. All I thought of is I'm going to show the people that told me I'm a failure. And there was a lot of them, believe me, there were people, even when I went from my PRMC at Limston that went, you won't pass that. You're, you're not, the, the Royal Marines won't want someone like you, right? That, that What I'm trying to say is, this isn't about me. That, that I'm trying to paint the picture of this is a quite a fairly typical scenario for a lot of us that, that join something like the Marines. So there's me carrying all this trauma from a battered childhood into the military. <laughs> Right, right. Then having the coziness of the military where I didn't really have to think for myself. I just had to say, yes, sir, even when I didn't really mean it. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then you come out. It's no surprise that I ended up on my ass when I came out. I, I had no I had no no skills to deal with everything that just suddenly caught caught up with me. And um and so for some of our boys and girls now who've been in heavy firefights and stuff, they've got all that to deal with as, as well, right? During my service, we only, in, in, in combat, so on active service, we only lost one guy. And although obviously he's my brother, he wasn't like a personal friend of mine. So it didn't, you know, it didn't affect me on a, on a personal level, but for people that have been in the thick of it, and yeah, I mean, there was a guy in, there was a guy I spoke to once, he was in, he was in the Northern Ireland conflict like I was, and he went to bed one night in a room with like, let's just say 15 oppos in it, so 15 of his brothers, the next night, it was just him. It was, I don't know if it was Ennis Skilling, it was one of these big IRA bombs that had gone off. Mm -hmm. I think it was a secondary device as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it just, it had taken all, it, all his mates out. I mean, you can't really, can't imagine that level of horror, you know? Right, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. No, yeah, it's, it, it's uh, like I said, we need to do a better job, I think, at, um, at reaching people when they come back, yeah, mentally health wise, and, and whatever that is, and I don't know what it is, but, uh, but it's obviously still an epidemic, we still have people here, you know, we have the 22, you know, they say, roughly 22 veterans a day commit suicide. Mm. Uh, and it's, I think there are a lot of guys carrying around depression, carrying around guilt, uh, I know I did after Iraq, and I didn't have a particularly horrible experience in 2003 when I went to Iraq, which was just before I retired. Um, but, but you know, there's still, I know when I came back, I was not the guy that, that went over there. And, uh, and it affected me in many ways when I came back. Um, to this day, you, you know, just decisions I made, things I did that uh, weren't necessarily wise choices and and it just it kind of spiraled downward um until i was able to you know to pull myself out of that and luckily i made it through but yeah i mean i think it, and then becoming a, a police officer after that where you again just see the worst of the worst you know you see people you see suicides you see homicides you see assaults uh, you just see people at their worst <clears throat> you're constantly dealing with people who have either experienced trauma or, um, or committed trauma, you know, and, and, and it just was more baggage added, you know, more bad experiences that I didn't deal with in a healthy way. And, uh, and you know, mm. just brought me to where I am now, which is a great place, but there was some, definitely some low points after I came back from Iraq, for sure. Yes, a message for anyone out there that's watching or listening to this who's struggling you know, hang in there because when you come out the other side, you'll be such a, a clearer headed person. You'll, you'll have it all in frame and you'll understand it. And, and then you'll start smashing it again, smashing life. Yeah. I mean, um, hang in there, talk to someone, find yeah, someone find, who's been there. Yeah. Find someone who you can, who you can uh, share with. 
Mm. You know, it does, it helps. It, it just so much better to get it off your chest and to find somebody, whether that's an oppo or whether that's uh, a loved one, whoever it is, but find somebody you can talk to and just, and just get those things out in the open because mm. if inside they just fester and just, you know, it's just like a cancer. It's just, yeah, it's, it's unhealthy for you. So find yeah. somebody to, to discuss it with. Robert, I, I'm dying to talk to you about your, your police work, but can we just um, talk about your time at Limston? What, what, yeah. When, when did that take place? So I was, I, I, just before I went over, I was a drill instructor. So I had, I had been a drill instructor in the US, um, and this is mid 90s. And at the time it was a two year tour. So I, I was just finishing up my, my second year as a drill instructor in the US. And um, I was getting ready to, to go to my next unit. And, and you kind of have a little say, and the longer you're in, the more say you have about where you want to go next. And I intended to go back to an operational unit, go back. I was actually going to go back to a reconnaissance unit. I had orders, um, which meant, you know, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to move on. I had a move date and everything. And I, had, I didn't even realize we had that we had five U.S. Marines who were uh, on exchange with the Royal Marines. I didn't even know it existed. I'd never heard of it. And, and maybe two months before I was due to, to rotate to my next duty station, a, a guy just mentioned it one day. And he said that the, he had brought it up that there was someone at Limston who, which we call it the drill instructor exchange, but really, uh, you know, as well as I do that the, uh, the troop sergeant is not a drill instructor by any means. You know, you have one DL over there, whereas we have all our drill instructors are, you know, the guys with the big funny hats and they're yeah. all screaming. And, and it's such a different system for you, for you guys. But um, so I, I inquired to my, what we call a monitor, which is a person that monitors your career, kind of um, makes sure people get to the right place and all billets are filled. And I, I asked him, he said, yeah, I'm actually getting ready to, to pick someone for that. I have, you know, about 10 people who have applied. Um, are you interested? And I said, yeah, very. And so I, I put in a package for it. And uh, I, like just before I would have deployed, I got word that, that I had been selected to go. And so he changed my orders. And uh, I think it was June of 97, I flew over, uh, reported into Limston and uh, they don't, they don't make you go to the all arms course. Um, but of course, for me, there was no option. I was like, I gotta, I gotta earn me Barry, you know, and just, wow. uh, so I spent the first month or two because they, they, I think they were just finishing up an all arms course <clears throat> and they just really, they set me up for success. Most days, I, sp I think I spent three days a week on bottom field. Um, and I would just work out with the recruits. So I would do bottom field three times a week. And I had pretty much, by the time I got on the all arms, I had done everything. I had, I had done the, the assault course. I didn't do the full Tarzan assault um, as a one -er, you know, as you do in the course, but I had, I had gone through all of it. Mm -hmm. I had done the, uh, pretty much everything you could do, but in little pieces. So I felt really good about going on course. Um, of course, once, it, once that 12 weeks, I believe at the time the arm, all arms was 12 weeks, you know, once that hit and you went through it, it was just, it was unbelievable. I mean, it was so um, just ball busting. It was 12 weeks nonstop. I lost two stone. Um, yeah, I came out the other side and I was, I had lost so much weight because it, it was just day after day, relentless doing the commando tests and bottom field pass out. And, uh, and then the exercises in between, you know, up in, um, up in Woodbury Common or, or out in Dartmoor. And, and so they really set me up for success. So, and then uh, I got on course, which, so I passed out in December. So I guess I would have started in late October, maybe somewhere in October, I started the course. And, uh, and I remember, so when I had done, when I was doing bottom field, one of the PTIs that was working with me, he, he was showing me everything. And he told me, don't, the worst thing that can happen to you is that you fail the initial rope climb because you'll get another shot at it after you do the rest of the course, but you'll never make it. 
He goes, there's no way yeah, because you're going to be hanging out so bad. Now, now you've done the whole course, you've done the full regain, you've done everything else. And now you're going to try to climb the rope again. And he goes, you'll never make it. So don't let it happen to you. So on the morning, it was, it was drizzly, rainy, typical Limston day. And I remember I got to the rope. I was feeling good. I, I felt so well rehearsed and everything was good. And I was in probably the best shape of my life. I think I was 31 when I went through. And uh, I start climbing the 30-foot rope. And, uh, and I just start to slip. And I'm oh. climbing and I'm slipping. And I, my head is, I just start to, just start to psych myself out. And I, I'm just looking up and I, I'm not going to make it. And finally, I realize I'm not getting to the top of the rope. And that PTI's words just were just banging in my head you'll never make the second rope climb it's not going to happen so just pack it in you know I mean that's how I felt and of course I didn't um and I did the rest of the course did the regain and so now I've got to climb this rope again and and I remember just it had dried up a little bit the, the rain had stopped and uh, there was just no way I wasn't going to make it to the top of that rope and so that got the second attempt and I just got up to the top and I I got up there. I, I know you had to slap the top and I don't remember what you had to say, but you had to yell out something that you had made it. And I just, I, I just stood there for a minute. I looked out over the, over the river X over the flats and just, uh, yeah, I just couldn't believe that I'd made that, but that was, you know, one small piece of that whole course. And it just got worse from there. I mean, <laughs> you know, it never stopped. So how, how do, I'm going to do a comparison hint, uh, thing, thing here, Rob. I might actually just put this out as a little clip because it's quite fascinating. Um, was it, so was it a massive eye opener to see what the British Marines, how they train? Because of course, we're commandos, which just, you know, it, it's like a different role from the infantry roles. It's, a, right. it's, an, it's like another thing again. Um, was that kind of a shock to you? Was that a lot different to the USMC training that you'd done? Yeah, especially. So, you know, our recruit training, our boot camp is, um, what is it now? I, I, gosh, I don't even know what it is now. I've been retired so long. I don't keep up on much of it, but so I think it's, uh, 13 weeks, maybe yeah, our, our, our yeah. boot camp, our recruit training which is about the same as the commando course, uh, you know, the all arms commando course, but uh, it, it's so different. It's apples and oranges. I watched a video the other day, actually of a U.S. Marine who was watching a, a Royal Marines uh, video on recruit training. And I, I just kept, I wanted to yell at the screen because it, you can't compare the two. They're so different. Um, ours is pretty short. It's the I think it's the longest recruit training in the in the U.S. military, but it's still pretty short, and it's designed. It's it's you know it's the uh, brainwashing, right? It's it's that indoctrination of you take this slimy civilian and you just pound USMC into him, you know, just 24 hours a day, everything, and you teach them history, culture, customs and courtesies, how to march, how to walk, how to put their socks on, how to eat, and it and it's that's what it is. I mean, it is that for 12 weeks nonstop. You don't get a day off. Um, you get Sundays in the afternoon, you get a couple hours to sit in the barracks, uh, in the squad bay and write letters and, and you know lie to your family how great it is. It, and it's, but there's no time off. You never leave, you never leave base. Um, you don't have any time where you just walk around on your own, just strolling about the camp and, and get to, to relax. There's none of it nonstop. And, and, you know, when I went over there, I, I didn't have any preconceived notions of what the training was going to be like, but I did know it was much longer um, and that it was, you know, it, it's, I look at it in three phases, right? It's like the, the initial phase is where you're taking a civilian and you're kind of teaching them about the core, you know, your core and kind of giving them that transition into kind of a basic Marine, basic soldier, you know? And then you have the second phase where you teach them how to be an infantryman, a rifleman, you know, how to fight in the field. And then the commando phase where you're, you know, you're turning them into a commando. And ours really isn't like that. After you leave recruit training, all of our recruits from every different job skill, you know, every, we call them MOS, the military occupational specialty, they're all in the same place. So you've got, 
you got butchers and bakers next to next to infantry guys. And so they all do the exact same thing. After that, they go on to their further school where they learn how to repair helicopters or, um, you know, fire javelin missiles or whatever it is. And, and, and so the, the schooling later is more of, of making you that job skill. Um, and I know, I know there are other, you know, commandos, what, what other skills do they have? I mean, it's not everyone's in a commando unit, right? Yeah, when you come out of Royal Marines training, pretty much everybody goes to a commando unit because you're right. kind of expected to have um, experience as a commando, you know, for a year, maybe do some um, specialist training, like up in the Arctic where we do uh, warfare training up in the north of Norway. Or you might have a deployment, obviously back in my day, um, it was the Northern Ireland conflict. More, more recently, it's obviously been the Middle East. And then you can look to specialize as a driver, um, a chef, a clerk. Um, when you're in your commando unit, you might choose to go into more to, you know, you might get a bit of experience as a rifleman and then be opt to go to the mortar platoon, you know, or heavy weapons, this, this kind of thing, right? But after you've done your sort of year and a half, you can then, you might want to be a drill instructor, right? Normally, no one wants to do that job. It's not really, it, 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 the thought of being at Limpston and that's your job on that parade square every single day, it's not what everyone, well, I'm not saying it's a bad job or anything. I'm just saying right. it, it, back in my day, they used to ping you, we call it pinging. Pinging means you get told you're going to do it. <laughs> At which point, a lot of people, or many people in my day, would put their chit in. They they would just leave. They'd say, "Sorry, I didn't join up to do that." And yeah, yeah. There was a, sometimes a, a bit of negotiation there. Signaler was another one. You know, very professional, respectable commando job. But if you don't want to be a signaler, you don't want to be a signaler. And there was yeah. a there was a a dearth, if that's the right word, or you know, a a, a lack. And so people would get ping, ping for that. And then, of course, you've got the Holy Grail, which is to join the special boat service. Yeah, right. So yeah. The, the Navy's version of um, special forces. Um, so, yeah. Did you find, Robert, like, for example, the endurance course? I mean, that is, it's just hard, isn't it? it oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I reckon... No disrespect to my brothers across the water there, but I reckon the average American Marine would probably not get too far on it before going, this is. Yeah. It, it, and at the time, I, I, I believe they've put uh, a little more safety features uh, underneath, right? At this point, I believe they have. I think I've seen videos where they, but at the time, if you fall, fell off any of those obstacles, it, there was nothing to catch you. There was, I don't think any of them had netting or anything to help if you fell. We actually, when I was there, we, there was one lad, he was, do you remember the double ropes where you come down the double ropes? Yeah. Um, and I think after that you get on the, the beam and then you run and do the, mm -hmm. the jump and punch through the, through the netting. Well, he was coming down those double ropes and fell and both of his, uh, his, bones came through his wrist so he fell and landed somehow like this and and uh and he was just screaming but that i think that's a good 10 15 foot fall yeah. off the double ropes and, and just had open fractures on both of his wrists um yeah that's the the tarzan assault course or the tarzan course which joins oh on. you were talking you were talking the endurance course i'm talking up on woodbury common yes yes yeah, that was, um, yeah, quite a, quite a course. I mean, and I remember the first time we did it, we had just finished a week-long exercise where we were digging in uh, up on Woodbury Common. We had dug in, it had rained all week. And, and so they took us through it twice. The first time, just to show us the obstacles, kind of walk us through it, just, just the part on the common. And then... Uh, after we had gone through it, they had showed us how to do each obstacle. Then we did it again at full speed. 
um, and then ran back all the way back uh, to Limston. And it was just, it was, I actually passed out on that. I had uh, hypoglycemia and passed out on the way back. It was, it was just unbelievable. I should explain for our, for our um, American brothers and sisters listening. So the endurance course, you, you jog four miles up to the start. So you do that in your three man sec. You're in a three man section. You jog four miles to the start. Then under the timer, your your threesome is off. You run a four mile. You then run a four mile course cross country, and it's all of a. It's all either up or down. There's no like <laughs> in between. But what is in between are these tunnels. Some of them are up to a hundred meters long and in my day they were made of corrugated iron which had all collapsed down in so you've got mud pouring through you've got a river running down the tunnel so so like a stream and you've got to get in there and crawl that hundred meters and at times you've got that much air to, to, to above the water to breathe and of course, you've got to try and keep your rifle. Right. You know, you're, have doing to try in, to, yeah. you're doing this in all your fighting order, right? So not your Bergen, obviously, because it's too small to get through these holes. When you've done that four mile course, you then hit the what we call the tarmac, uh, the metal road, which means tarmac. And you've got to run another four miles back to the camp. So at this stage, you're up to 12 miles. I think the course might be a bit shorter than four miles. It might it might be about two two and a half or something. But anyway, you 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 you're running like ten miles, soaking wet. So all of your kit and clothing is now weighing double, if if not treble. I mean, it feels like you've got a refrigerator on your on your back. <laughs> it's just insane. And you've got to run four miles down that metal road back to the camp's rifle range. Then you've got to quickly pull your, the barrel of your weapon through um, to clean it. A little light oil, but you, you, you know all this is, is, is done in super fast time. And then you've got to get 10 shots on the target, um, which so long as your weapon's clean is, is the easiest bit. Right. We did it in February. So once we hit that first pool that you wade through this uh, river, up to your neck you're going to have your rifle above your head obviously to keep it dry and you pull yourself along on this rope and it's about you know 15 meters to get to the other side and it's in february in the uk which so you're talking it's about minus six air temperature this is um celsius now so it's cold, it's winter. The ice on the, the pool is three inches thick. So the first people across have got to break break through the ice. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to sell it here because like yourself, Robert, I've seen comparison videos online and it's, it's like this guy isn't really getting this, is he? he? I don't think he understands that this is like really fucking hard yeah. the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life and most people couldn't it's just a fact most people couldn't do it no that's true i mean we we i remember the the troops that i that i was troop sergeant for you know you just you just watch guys drop i mean every day we used to have in the initial when they started they would take a true picture of all the recruits that were starting together and, and what we would do is as recruits, and I'm sure this has probably been around for years, but we would we would color out the face of that recruit. And so you start with, let's say you start with 50, 50 nods, you know, at the, at the end of the troop, you may have, you know, you may have 10, 10 faces that have not been blacked out, that haven't been back trooped or, or just, uh, you know, just couldn't make it, moved on, tried something else, um, got injured, went to hunter troop. And you just watch the troop dwindle and then you get new, you're constantly getting new recruits uh, as well that had been back trooped and they, they pick up with your troop. I don't, I don't know how many, I don't know what the ratio is of how many recruits make it on one tribe, but 
it, it's not very high. I mean, it really is tough training. I would say um, it, not to, not to slag off U S Marines because obviously I've been through both, but yeah, it's, it's such hard training. <clears throat> I mean, and, and these are young kids and, and uh, physically just unbelievable, you know, which I think is why, um, the other thing I really liked over there that you guys do is you start to give the recruits um, responsibility right from the get go. You would, you know, I mean, not necessarily an induction, but after that, um, once that, once they joined the troop and training proper, you have, you have a recruit who's in charge of getting the other recruits outside um, in the morning. You know, you're not like in the U.S. Marine Corps, we are yelling at them. We literally get them dressed by the numbers. You wake them up, you stand them online, they stand in an open squad bay facing each other. And then you send them all, you send half to the bathroom while the other half you're getting them dressed. And then they switch these, these, this lot goes to the bathroom and then these guys are getting dressed, but you're telling them like, put a sock on now, right sock, um, trousers on now, pants on, you know, and, and you're just doing that step by step. And um, really, they don't have any responsibility as recruits until much later in the training in that 13 weeks. And so I don't I think I used to say after I'd done both, I used to say that we turn out a USMC turns out a great recruit um, because that's what they are. They're still kind of a recruit um, until they go to their next their next phase. And I think by the end of the commando course, you've experienced leadership. You've been responsible and, and had to pay for somebody else's mistakes because you didn't get them ready. You know, you would, you would, but you would go out in the morning and a recruit would be there. He had got everyone ready. And we do that a little bit in the USMC, but not as much, not to that extent where guys are leading patrols, you know, actually uh, writing an op, an op order, writing patrol order and leading a patrol and taking that leadership responsibility. So I think at the end of the commando course, uh, a lot of a lot of those guys are they're ready to to go out into the the commando forces and and actually operate and actually you know be a be a leader if they have to. Robert, I've got to ask you because um, it's not often you get the the chance to ask things like this, but full metal jacket. Yeah, I watched the making of it again last night. It's just one of those addictive <laughs> things you can watch and watch and watch um lee uh, ermy did i say his name right yeah yeah arlie ermy um yeah did a fantastic job came on the the film as an advisor and then ended up going no look just give me the part i can i can yeah, do I'll it great. better than this guy right um how for those of us obviously that haven't been in the usmc how how realistic is is that for for what it's actually like for the, for the obviously it's, it's a hollywoodized version but it is uh it's it's pretty accurate i mean it is that's how a drill instructor is there is a stereotypical drill instructor and um i won't give away too many secrets but there's actually roles that drill instructors play um usually you have a three three-man drill instructor team and they each kind of have a role there's kind of the senior guy who we call him the Papa Bear. He's the one who uh, makes the recruits feel good. Um, he can speak to them nicely and, and kind of get them to uh, respond. You know, he's kind of the father figure. And then you've got the one who's a complete a-hole that does nothing but yell. He's never, never kind. And it just his job is just to discipline just constantly. You know, anybody looks around, he's in their face yelling at them, telling them to like, keep their eyes to the front and, and uh, making them do push-ups and sit-ups and, and whatever else and, and uh, incentive exercises. And then there's the, the one who's kind of the drill guy. And he's the one that focuses on drill, on getting them to, because uh, I, I think the USMC, I think we have, we're just some of the best drill uh, people out there. I mean, we really take drill seriously and um, focus on it in recruit training as a way to build teamwork and discipline and get guys to work it together as a unit. You know, we do that through just um, drill for hours on end, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's how it is. I mean, you are, you are by the end of your first week as a drill instructor, you, you can't speak anymore. You've yelled so much and you're up with them from 
from basically from dust. To, you're actually up awake before the recruits because you wake them up and you go to bed after them. And, and so it's just nonstop for, uh, for the first, I would say first three or four weeks <clears throat> where you are just breaking them down, you know, as, as recruits and you're just instilling that discipline and, and uh, and as time goes on, you know, you're not yelling as I, hopefully you're not yelling as much at the end because hopefully by then you've, you've brought them and you see the, the transition as they, as they make their way out and go out to the fleet Marine force and join units. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's pretty accurate, honestly. And these guys that they're, they're rig, so their, their clothing, it is immaculate, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You, you, have several uniforms that you bring to work. And if you get anything, if you get too wrinkly or if, if you uh, get anything on it, it gets a little bit soiled, you're switching it out, putting on another one. And we would do things like we would put, um, we would spray the inside so you wouldn't sweat through. Um, and just just different tricks wow. you, know, you would do to, to always have that appearance. And so is it true that if you don't like your drill instructor, you, you can just shoot them. Yeah, you shoot them and then you and then usually you off yourself on the toilet is the best way to do it. That that was um a bit of an unexpected turn in that. Well, I guess you could see it was something not good was gonna come out of that relationship. Right, right. Um it it, it should be pointed out that people do die in training though, don't they? I mean, I don't know how it was for you guys, but we had guys commit suicide. We had one chap um, shot himself in the head. We had another recruit pointed his weapon at someone. He was, he was piss-assing around and, and, and he shot, shot the guy dead. Um, guys drowning. Um, and this is just the in-training bit. There's when guys go on leave and they get up to the shenanigans on leave, like um, car crashes and that sort of thing. You, you know, you lose people there as well. Is was that your experience? Yeah, we we have the same thing. You know, uh, I know once you get in in the USMC, I, I think it is easier to to kind of get out of the Royal Marines if you decide it's it's not for you. Um, but the USMC you're there. I mean, you are stuck there unless you do something really, really stupid. But I remember there was kids who would try to, uh, they would try to go, you know, go UA on authorized absence. They would disappear in the night, try to get off base, which it's, it's not impossible. It's tough, but it's not impossible. Um, I remember when I was in, at, when I joined in 1984, <laughs> this kid had take, and I was at Paris Island, which is, you know, uh, it's, it's like an island. I mean, it's proper island. So surrounded by water, swampy water. And uh, this kid had taken all the bleach bottles and emptied them so he could make a raft and he was going to float off of Paris Island to escape the madness. Um, they, <laughs> they caught him after, I think he'd wasted a lot of bleach and that was about as far as he got. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's just not for everybody, is it? I mean, no. some people just get there and, and the shock. I remember when I was in again, we had this one kid and he lost so much weight. He was, he was overweight, um, which is rare that you even get into the USMC overweight, but he was a little overweight. And we were our first day, we went to the, the chow hall to, uh, to have our, our breakfast, I think it was, or maybe lunch. And he passed out. And you know the human the human being response to someone passing out is to go see if they need help. Well, the drill instructor response is to scream at them and to just yell at them for passing out. And you know how could they possibly be such a weak, pathetic thing? You know and pass out. And so the drill instructors just uh, just attack this kid who's laying there, just fallen face first on the ground. And I remember thinking, what the hell have I got myself into? You know these people are subhumans. Um, and he made it though. He lost a ton of weight. And, and, you know, I think that when you make it through training, whether it's the USMC or the Royal Marines, you know, that, that feeling of pride, it, it sticks with you forever. Right. It's just something that, you know, you've accomplished that goal and it's just, it, it, it's with you forever. I think that's why, you know, in the U S we say once a Marine, always a Marine, you know, it's, it's, 
we never say ex Marine. And now they don't even say former Marine. They just say he's a Marine, you know, for the rest of your life. Yes. It's, 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 it's the same here, but, but it kind of is, it's, it, you know, something goes in you, you become a part of something and, 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 and that's something that goes in and you become a part of isn't, isn't nothing to do with the technical numbers that are written down in Whitehall or the MOD, right? It's, um, how did you join the police? Uh, so I, I retired in from the USMC in 2004. And, uh, you know, I, I had never really concentrated on anything except uh, infantry, really. And then toward the end, as you said, I became a nuclear biological chemical defense officer. But that was my last four years. <clears throat> and I really didn't have, I had not learned a lot of skills. I mean, skills that are applicable to, to real life. And so um, I just decided the police force was kind of a, a normal step for me to go to. Um, so I joined and uh, went to the police academy. I think I was 38 at the time. Wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, so a little older, you know, most, I think most officers join mid twenties, I think is normal. Although I've seen older, we had one one guy joined. He was in his fifties when he went to the academy, which is pretty good. I mean, you have to be pretty fit. It's like anything else. Um, I think a lot of police officers they there there's a lot of strict requirements physically to get in, but after you're in, there's none. And so I think that's why you see a lot of police officers who uh, maybe don't look the fittest because they've they've made that initial entry physically and then after that they they uh maybe uh, visit dunkin donuts a little too much <laughs> but uh so you know you go through the academy and and then after that you go into what we call field training which is where you know the academy is is <clears throat> scenarios and it's all very it's all very it's just it's fake it's a fake environment you know you're doing these scenarios where you're dealing with a domestic violence or an assault or a crime whatever it is but it's all actors and then so you get into field training and now it's uh there's someone there with you an experienced officer who is watching your every move and he and he's making sure that you're you know um doing things the correct way by procedure and by the law you know i mean there's a lot of laws to learn and so an officer can definitely make mistakes and uh, in the early days, you know, as you're training and then eventually you're out on your own and then you're doing the job and it's, uh, it's a tough job. I, I respect police very much. I did it for 14 years and um, man, those guys have a tough job. You know, and it's gotten tougher. What's it like being armed then in, in let's call it Civvy Street? You know, the culture here is so different as far as the gun culture, um, you know, not to get political, but uh, we are just a, a country who we, we enjoy our, our right to, to bear arms and to have firearms. And, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of U.S. citizens that own firearms are responsible. They'll never commit a crime, um, period. And they'll certainly never commit a crime involving a firearm. Here in Arizona, you can carry anybody, any civilian who hasn't been uh, maybe a felon, you know, or someone who's a prohibited possessor, they can walk the streets every day with a firearm on their side, go to a shop. Um, and, and you'll see someone, you see it all the time here in Walmarts, which, uh, you know, Walmarts, but they'll have a firearm on their side and it's, you don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just, uh, but it's, it's, it's very historical for you guys, isn't it? I mean, you, you the right to bear arms is in your constitution. Right. Yeah, it's you, our constitution. You know, right? it's, act, it's actually in ours, Robert. <clears throat> is it? it yeah. It's that. the right of every Englishman to, 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 to carry a firearm. But we're ruled here by a bunch, well, you know, <laughs> say, <laughs> the same bunch of sociopaths that run the planet, and they somehow obfuscated the, our are inalienable is it is that the right word are in inalienable rights so what right. the rights we're born with as human beings they've managed to somehow circumvent that and replace it with all this crappy european you know and, and british no well, we're not british i mean we're obviously we're proud to be part of this island and 
and um, and the tip of Northern Ireland as it is, but we, we're English at the end. Of it. That's our country of England, right? Mm-hmm. And, but we're governed by British law, which isn't in our best interest because for a start, we don't have the right to bear arms. And with what's going on at the moment, globally, there's yeah. never been a more important time than to be able to stand up for, for, for freedom and righteousness. And we're, lo- we're losing all that here now. We're, we're literally becoming uh, a totalitarian state. Um, you know, you're going to have to buy everything you want from Amazon now because they've shut down all the, they've collapsed all the, the, the small businessmen, right? Yeah. Um, they, by, by playing their, playing their games. Um, it's frightening. So you don't need, need to explain to me the, 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 um, not just the importance of having the right to defend yourself, but also the history behind it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm with you, you know, obviously you, you have to be careful with people who, who might be unwell or, or, or are going to use that, those arms for criminal means. But when you weigh up the pros and against the cons, it's, I think, you know, everyone has the right to, to not, to not be uh, in, in, enslaved. Um, yeah, it, and you know we're in a constant struggle here as well with our Second Amendment rights. Um, where I, I feel like it's you know every day we're one step closer to to losing those um, mm-hmm. to where they just clamp down on the gun laws. Um, and you know it's it's a tenuous thing. I mean, I, I could see where we could end up where you are eventually. Yeah. I mean, you know, people say there'd be a revolution and, uh, but the reality is um, it happened to you. It happened to Australians. And, uh, and I think it's possible. I think, you know, the second amendment, the NRA, different organizations that support the second amendment and gun owners rights are for us, it's important to join those things and just, uh, you know, to be an advocate because most people don't commit crimes. You know, most people that, that own firearms We'll never use them for nefarious means. Mm-hmm. So it's it's uh, the statistics are not that everyone in the U.S. Contrary to what the news shows, are you know we're we're killing each other on a daily basis in droves. You know you can't walk around because it's too dangerous. Um, but I think sometimes I know when I'm out of the country, when I'm when I'm traveling, it's you kind of get that impression that people feel like the U.S. is you know one big firefight, like it's a it's like it's an action movie or something. And it's just not like that. You know, you don't, your day to day life, you don't, you don't think about gun crime and gosh, I'm afraid to go out because I may get shot today. It's just not like that. Yeah. I'm very fortunate because I don't watch the news. <laughs> yeah. It's a good idea. Yeah. Right. I, I know who owns the news. So why, 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 right. and they don't like me and they don't like my family. And in fact, they don't like anyone except, <laughs> except themselves. Yeah, so yeah. Why, why would I watch their bullshit propaganda, which is just mm-hmm. one huge lie? And I can't even go there, Robert, because when it with respect to, uh, you know, these things, I'm seeing stuff on the news that from a serviceman's perspective. Yeah, that is that that narrative don't make sense. Not right. Not if you know how to use a weapon. And the the damage that it can do, what you know, what our precious mainstream media is telling us. <coughs> now, sorry, not not, you know, I have to live in the real real world because I only get one life, and I want to keep it real. If you're trying to tell me that I'm supposed to believe that, no, nah, ne- ne- never gonna never gonna happen. But let's move on to your SWAT days because that <laughs> it's all it's all getting a bit exciting. <laughs> uh yeah so so i think most police departments you have to do a, a year or two get a little experience as a as a street cop before you can try out for the swat team um and then eventually and again it's a it's a physical test yeah it's you have to have a little higher physical standard which where i mentioned most officers don't maybe have a, a yearly physical fitness test swat does if probably more than yearly, probably uh, several times a year where you make sure that guys are, are fit for that job. Um, Cause we're wearing, 
heavy, you know, uh, plate carriers and just everything we have on and here in Phoenix where it can be 120 degree Fahrenheit, which again, I don't know what that is Celsius, but really freaking hot. Yeah. And sometimes you're on a, on a scene for hours um, wearing this kit and it's just, it's just balls hot out. And you're, you know, you have to be fit to do that because then at the end of the day um, you could be there for five, six hours. And then all of a sudden that's when it happens, you know? So it's kind of like, you have to be fit to fight when you get to the objective. Right. So we make sure that everybody on a SWAT team is, is in good physical shape. Um, just, extra training every month, you know, doing, uh, going into shoot houses, um, practicing just your, your tactics inside a house, um, and just, uh, doing, uh, warrants, you know, serving warrants. We have guys that are trained on gas, how to use gas and CS in case we need to use that to get somebody out of a, out of a house, out of a barricade situation. And, and then you just, you know, you're on the SWAT team and now ours was not a full-time SWAT team, bigger cities like Phoenix, they have a full-time where those guys are SWAT. That's all they do. Um, smaller departments will have, it's a, it's a collateral duty. So you'll be, you'll do your, your daily job, whether you're a detective or a street cop. And then anytime that there's a need for a SWAT team, um, you know, you pick up your gear, you put it on and now you're, now you're a SWAT guy. So that's why it's imperative that you train enough and because it's not every day that you train enough to where when it's needed, you are, you know, you're, you're ready for it mm. and you've got the training experience to, to do the job. So are you saying that your SWAT role isn't all the time? That's like when, when you're called, you're called up to do that. Yeah. So at most, almost every smaller department <clears throat> just, they don't have, there's not enough, uh, not enough officers to have them, <clears throat> do that full time ah, yeah. and so <clears throat> they would do their normal job and then um, that would be something they would do on the side which yeah. means you got you give a lot of extra time um, so it's kind of like a quick reaction force role isn't yeah it? exactly exactly yeah. and some places e even more rural have regional teams where several departments will make up a SWAT team for that that area you know if it's really rural yeah <clears throat> I, get, I got you and did you get to fire a lot of rounds on the range to, to, to be good? Yeah, we, we, we went to the range way more than your average officer. We would go, usually we would go monthly. We would try to put, put rounds down range and just, you know, you know, practice tactics. And sometimes we would just work on drills, right? Just your basic shooting skills, which is what makes you good is just to work on the basics. And then other times we would, we would use, go to a shoot house and we'd do a live fire shoot house which as you know, anytime you're, you're in close proximity to other people, you really have to trust those people. Mm -hmm. um, when, you're, when you're entering a room and you're shooting rounds, um, feet away from other people, you know, you, you kind of bond. The SWAT team was, to me, it was kind of like being back in the military again because you, you build up that camaraderie where these are guys that you're gonna be, <clears throat> you know, potentially fighting alongside, but you're definitely gonna be in, ex in situations where you've got to trust them with your life and, mm -hmm. and they've got to trust you with yours you know, and, and to watch each other's back. So did you ever use the, the, the two, two conversion kits for, well, when we, when we were training uh, for the Northern Ireland conflict, you do that um, typical scenario where you're walking through a scene and the, and the, uh, the enemy or <laughs> what, what, what we call the enemy is pop, pop, popping up right. all around you and you've got to quickly, you know, double tap the target. And, uh, and obviously if you've got your team and you're all firing 5.56 millimeter, it can, there's a chance for a ricochet or, or you, you might just accidentally <laughs> shoot someone. Um, so what they would do, Robert, is you get this little conversion kit and you put it inside the bre breech of your rifle and then it fires 2.2 instead of 5.56. And obviously, if you get hit by a 2.2, <coughs> unless you're really unlucky, it, it's, it's going to hurt you, but it's not yeah. most likely not going to kill you. Right. Now, we usually use, we use what was called frangible ammo, which would, uh, it wasn't full metal. It, it would, so we would have in the shoot houses, we would have targets that um, would stop the rounds. 
And so they, you would use that and then you would use frangible ammo, which would just kind of stop a lot quicker. It didn't have the same penetration power of like a full metal jacket or a hollow point. Uh, got you. We would use those. But uh, and we would always rehearse, you know, we would we would always do a do a dry run first where you have no ammo and you're just working on on kind of it's almost like a dance. Right. You know, you come in, you enter a house and everyone has their positions and, you know, who's going to flow into a room. Um, how you're going to occupy that room based on where the door is, based on um, the size of the room. And, and we would just rehearse that for hours on end before we ever went live with live ammunition. Did you ever find, I mean, I was part of a high security detachment for 13 months, right? And we would um, go into compartments of the ship and you'd have your set routine, like, like you say. But I tell you what, sometimes the guy, the guy that had been designated to be the enemy would just pop up and <laughs> take you all, but you know, oh yeah, it, it just happens so quickly. You haven't got time to haven't really got time to like um, react to it. Did you ever find that? Yeah, well, so we actually had we were while I was on the SWAT team in six years, we actually were in a shooting. Um, we were <clears throat> serving a warrant in Phoenix because we had somebody on a task force <clears throat> and he had used us. Uh, um, he was from our department, but he was working with a task force on a, on a government agency, a federal agency. And so we had served this warrant. It was related to the cartels. And uh, we, we had what's called a no-knock warrant. I don't know if you've heard of those over there, but basically you can get a, an exception from the judge that says, hey, this is a really dangerous person. And if we knock on the door, we're giving them time yeah, yeah. to potentially um, prepare for us whether that's to, you know, to flush drugs down the toilet or whatever, which is not that big of a deal, but, but potentially they could be, while we're knocking and saying police department, uh, they're getting a firearm ready, um, you know, to meet us. So we have what's called a no knock warrant where um, the judge says, yeah, this is, you can not knock on this, in this instance, you don't have to knock. You can just um, open the door, you know, whether that's with a battering ram or whatever, but you can ram the door open and enter without, giving that person that advance warning that you're coming in. <clears throat> and so we had a no knock warrant, but we were actually, uh, we were going to do a quick knock. So we were just going to quickly knock, announce ourselves and then, and then ram the door open and go in. And so our, usually our front guy would have a shield, a ballistic shield has a little window in it so he can look through and, and use uh, and see and use it as uh, a shield in case there's anybody in there with weapons. And so we did a quick knock and then ran the door and the shield guy took a step in and he saw movement off to his right. So he, he turned and took one round right in the port. So he actually uh -oh. got shot right in the port of the, of the uh, shield and then took a second round further down. Um, and then we, we essentially had then had a firefight with this guy who had, um, we, we think it was a very small and very tight neighborhood. And we think he knew we were coming. Uh, we, we were in one of those Bearcats, which is those armored, you know, vehicles, which are uh, kind of noticeable when you've got yeah. uh, 12 SWAT guys hanging on the side, driving through your neighborhood. So we think they knew we were coming anyway. And, um, but yeah, he took two shots at us. So unfortunately, it, it didn't end well for him. Um, we had a firefight right down there in downtown Phoenix. And, uh, you know, so that was one of those crazy ones where, even though you you train for it, you rehearse for it, and you're prepared for it, you really don't expect it. You know, you don't expect to serve a warrant. We served, you know, hundred of them, and that was the first time that somebody actually, you know, uh, had shot at us. You know, that uh, took that action where he said, "Hey, I know there's there's twelve SWAT police officers there, but I'm gonna I'm gonna see what I can do and try my luck with it." And so it was, it was kind of uh, surreal, really, you know, even though you train for it, you don't expect it. You don't expect that someone would do that. But, yeah. uh, but we were, the team performed brilliantly and uh, and we all went home. I'm getting uh, flashbacks there to again to the Northern Ireland conflict. When we came under fire, it takes you a split second to realize what's going on. It's just, yeah. you know even though you've rehearsed it, you've trained it, 
takes to like the third shot, bang, 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 and then your brain's like, contact, take cover. Right. Uh, yeah. Blimey. <laughs> Robert, listen, you've been absolutely brilliant. I'm, I just it wouldn't be right not to finish up and talk about your traveling because that's been a big, big thing in my life. Um, what is, has it been a favorite place you visited? Uh, I, I would say Israel is definitely was definitely a highlight for me. Just the history, um, it, it, you know. I mean, you when when a Yank goes to the UK, we're like amazed at uh, the history there. You know, the age of some of the buildings. But I mean, Israel is just mm. you know unbelievable how how much they've managed to uncover <clears throat> as they dig and, and, you know, they look at, have different archeological sites. It, it's just, it blows you away. I mean, how. Is that your heritage there, Robert? No, 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 no. It just, um, so I think last year I went to like 17 countries, mm. just did a whirlwind tour of Europe. Um, and just, you know, just traveled all over, went to Egypt, um, Israel, Slovenia, of course, the UK, France, um, Germany, Austria, um, Belgium, which uh, Bruges, great place. Wow. If you've ever been to Bruges. Just I've been to, to Belgium about 80 times. I've never been to the capital. <laughs> Oh, you, you have to get to Bruges if you can. Is Bruges Just, the capital? Or I'm, uh, no, I'm, no, it's Brussels is the capital. Br Br Brussels, of course, it yeah, is it's yeah. the capital of the European Union, isn't it, Brussels? Is it? Yeah, I think or, it is. Or, or it's where the, the headquarters are. Right. I don't, so, like I yes, say, I don't, no, I, I don't watch the news, so I <laughs> right. get a lot of stuff. Um, but uh, so I would say Israel was one for the, uh, for just, the archaeology and just the history. Switzerland, probably one of the most beautiful countries I've been to. And I actually went with, when I was over with, um, at Limston. So, the, you know, we have other Marines who are on there. There's a Royal, there, or there's a uh, mountain leader who's down in Plymouth. Um, there's a U.S. Marine who's down there. There's one at Poole who's a, a boat guy. He's down at Poole. And then um, there's a marksmanship guy who's also at Limston. And then there's a, an officer. He was, he's the only operational one is our officer. And he was up at four or five commando up in Arbroath, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, um, and so I, I, so I was good friends with the mountain leader who was at, there at the same time. And they do an exercise every year. The, the mountain leaders, your mountain leaders go over to Switzerland and he invited me along. And so for a month, we just, we just climbed and skied and uh, just had a jolly over there. I mean, it was all, all paid for. Uh, we lived in, in Lauterbrunnen, which is a beautiful valley in Switzerland. We stayed in tents, but, uh, but we would just say, hey, we wanna go climb this, you know, the Finsterhorn or whatever. And, and a car would take us and drop us off and we would ski down the glacier um, and then climb. And <clears throat> it was just brilliant. So Amazing. I would say Switzerland, as far as just beautiful country, it's just, amazing the mountains are just so vast and you know just massive mountains beautiful yeah I've, I've been quite fortunate really i've been to jerusalem twice now and you know traveled around israel and palestine twice um really does feel very uh like the religious heartland of the world there doesn't it right yeah yeah i don't know how much of it is accurate and whatever i'm not I, i'm not really interested to be honest but well i mean i kind of am but i'm not interested <laughs> to, to get too much into the religious side it's just a, a fascinating place to visit and the desert yeah. is so be beautiful yeah you kind of if well, when you're in jerusalem and they've got all these kind of you know is it stances of the cross or whatever they call it and oh yeah yeah and the 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 um the olive grove what's that one called that you got the, was it garden of yosemite yosemite 
Um, Gethsemane, right? G Gethsemane, yes. yeah. Gethsemane. Um, the Mount of Olives. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever watched a film like uh, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, you can't help feeling these places there. Not if there ever was a guy called Jesus, like he was here on his last night and then he was over. <laughs> Like I say, I, I, you don't have to write to me, folks, and tell me anything. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy not to, I'm happy not to know some things. <laughs> but um, yes, wow, Robert, thank you ever so much. Um, thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Do, you, do you want people to come and find you? I mean, should I put the link for your LinkedIn profile below our yeah, video? Yeah. That's if fine. People, yeah, if people want to get in touch, brilliant. Yeah, that's fine. So stay on the line so I can thank you properly. But from one brother to another, thank, thank you for just enlightening, enlightening us to your fascinating life. Um, well, I, I appreciate it. I never uh, in my life thought I'd be invited on a podcast. So um, I, I appreciate it. And I, I appreciate talking to you and for everything you've done. And it sounds like, I mean, gosh, I would love to, uh, if I had a podcast, I'd have you on. It sounds like you've done some amazing things yourself it's uh sounds like you've had a good run yeah you know i take the rough with the smooth robert you know and and i don't i try and use my experiences now to for the for the better obviously i've done some stupid things over the years um yeah sorry i'm trying to avoid talking about the difficult times we find ourselves in because you know I'm going to say this to our friends at home. If there's ever time to be a warrior, it's now. And yeah. it's probably not the warrior in the traditional role that you're thinking of. Your freedom is being stolen in front of your eyes. And most people are going, okay. They have no idea what's going on. Right. And it's, you know, this is what guys like us fought for was freedom. If those. Yeah, you know, I, I, you're right. And people, I, I just feel like people are laying down, aren't they? Uh, They're just, those boys, many of the teenagers that gave their life on the beaches of Normandy to fight for your freedom, and you're just giving it away because you believe everything you see you see on your nine o'clock news. It, right. Yeah. You know, this is the frustration I I have, Robert. Is I I because of I've lived, worked, and traveled in eighty seven countries. It is. I often say eighty. It's actually eighty eighty seven across all seven continents not many people can tell me what what's going on you, you know have a have a more accurate view of it and it's it's just trying to drop the penny with people isn't it to get them to realize what's going on and and when you're brainwashed you're brainwashed and if all you know how to do is spout what you see in the media, that, that just, that's not going to help anyone. You need, you need to develop thinking skills. And I wouldn't care if it was just me, Robert, I'd go and drink myself to death. I, that, that's what I did for 30 years anyway. Right. But I, I have family now, you know, I have, I have a son and, you know, he needs to know his, his daddy is a legend. His daddy is a fighter that fought for his freedom, right? When the other parents just, just gave it up and, and, and didn't even know what, what they were giving up, you know, because they no longer read books anymore. And most of them are just like spent right, yeah. all, all their day, day, day like that, right? And I don't know what the future holds, mate, but I'll tell you what, I know, I know that I fought for people's freedom and that's a nice place to be. Um, yeah, and it'd be great if, you know, the reality is we're never not going to have wars <clears throat> as nice as that would be. Mm -hmm. the, the, like you said, the, the ruling elite, they're not going to ever let that happen. <clears throat> They'll keep us at war as long as they can. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and as much as uh, none of us want to go to war, it, you know, I'm just I'm thankful that there's guys who are willing to guys who are yeah. willing to, to lay it all on the line. Exactly. We, we've got wonderful men and women in our armed forces and they need to be treated with respect and not just used as a corporate bully boy thugs to go and you know secure this oil field or to to 
further the agenda of these sociopaths. And for the last 20 years, these sociopaths have just written, written their ticket. And we need to be real warriors and stand up and say no, because our brothers now and, and our sisters, but predominantly our brothers, they're, they're hanging themselves, you know, and dying in a, a pool of alcohol. Mm -hmm. And someone needs to stand up for that and 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 and, and say it how it is. So people right. like yourself, Robert, I r really appreciate you having you on the podcast. You know, true true warriors, not 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 tokenists that that um you know just happy to maintain the status quo. Anyway, to our friends at home, sorry if we ended on a bit of a serious note, but you know. In my 50 years on, 51 years on this planet, it, it's never been, you know, you want warfare, it, it, this is it. It's, it's never been more serious. It, re it really hasn't. But putting that to one side, massive love to you all. Please look after yourselves. If you can like and subscribe, and just support this uh, positive message we're trying to put out. And see you next time. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall. I'm a former Royal Marines Commando and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.